Recording has started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, another Roots to Shoots webinar by ArborJet. Today, JB Torsh, our Southeast Regional Tech Manager, will be talking about palm tree care and maintenance. Um, for anyone that is looking for ISA credits, uh, we will have a Google Sheet that you can click on and fill out your name and ISA number. Uh, as well as putting it into this chat feature uh, if where you can also enter questions. So type them into the chat now. Here, it looks like uh, Kara just put in the Google Doc link. So feel free to click on that. And then you can also put them in the chat. That way we have it in multiple places and can definitely get those credits submitted. Um, so again, JB Torsh, our Southeast Regional Tech Manager, he's been with the company for far, far more 11. years than I have. 11. 11 years with the company. Excellent. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's located in, in Central Florida. And um, yeah, he's, he's very, a very smart guy, does a lot of palm injections, can teach you a lot about palms. I know I pick something new up every time. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to make sure everyone's muted except for JB and turn off my screen, uh, my video. It's all yours, JB. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I uh, hope everybody's healthy out there on these crazy times. Um, I'm going to go through this presentation. It's going to be kind of general. Um, maintenance, nutrient deficiencies. We'll, we'll go over some of the more important insect issues, disease issues and also get into um, product recommendations for specific issues, along with some uh, methodology on injecting palms. Um, if you need some further, uh, more hands-on, there is a video on YouTube. You can just put, uh, you can just type in injecting palm trees in the keys, and it's about a 40 minute presentation uh, that really goes into depth of all the different ways to inject palms. Uh, many palms are, they're, they're different and, and we have some different ways to do it. So I don't want to get into that in this talk because that gets a little more involved. So this will be more 30,000 30, foot view. So as we move on here, we'll start with the nutrient deficiencies. And I know here in Florida, this is a huge problem with palms. I think uh, uh, with any plant material, some of the, the main issues we have is due to uh, just plants that aren't healthy, you know, just like humans. The healthier we are, the, the more resistant we are to certain uh, issues and diseases. So we'll start out with some of the major uh, nutrient deficiencies here and uh, move on from that. So I have this pH chart up here and you can see, you know, a lot of nutrient deficiencies can be traced back to uh, soil issues, uh, pH issues in the soil. I know that here in Florida, we have a very uh, a higher pH type soil. So it's a, definitely what we call more alkaline. As you go lower on the chart, that becomes more acidic, and the higher you go, becomes alkaline. Your sweet spot there, if you look at this chart, is right around six and a half. Go right up six and a half, you can see all those nutrients are available at, at that pH. That's like our ideal, what I would call the sweet spot. If we move either way, one way or the other, uh, kind of uh, can cause issues with, with uptake and availability of some of those essential nutrients. So then we'll get into what some of these, uh, these issues look like. Uh, a nitrogen deficiency generally is, is a yellowing, um, can kind of look like a, an iron deficiency. Uh, it's not a huge problem in, in palm trees. Um, it's, it's more of a problem in container palms, but uh, the symptoms will appear well, like many uh, deficiencies on the older fr fronds. And it's generally just a lack of nitrogen in the soil. Potassium, um, this is probably one of the, the most uh, important um, deficiencies, especially here in, in Florida, and, and a, potassium can actually be fatal to the palm over time. Uh, it can um, basically affect the health and vigor of the palm. Um, you can see that picture there is not the clearest, but that's kind of the symptomatic, um, what it looks like. Uh, the leaflets can have dead tissue, what we call necrosis, and that's generally along the margins of the leaves. You'll find spotting on the leaves. That's another huge giveaway, yellow to orange spots on the fronds, and you will get some black uh, necrotic spotting. 
uh, problem, problematic in sandy soils because of leaching. And, you know, I don't know where you're located, but here in Florida, you know, we're, we're sandy soils. So that's why potassium is such a, a major uh, issue, potassium deficiencies. Uh, Phosphajet will help. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the products, but Phosphajet uh, with the potassium in it will help uh, to alleviate some of these issues, especially potassium. Magnesium, very, very common uh, deficiency. And we see it a lot in our uh, Canary Island date palms. Um, and as you can see there in the picture on the left, it, it generally shows up more in the older fronds. Uh, very chlorotic bands along the leaflet margin. Uh, the tips of the leaves may actually uh, become necrotic. Um, and a lot of times you can have a, a potassium deficiency that will actually be enhanced or, or become more of a problem because of the magnesium deficiency. That's why it's so important to have all these nutrients. Uh, really, you, you, you don't want to be deficient in any nutrient, but it's, it's important to have that plant taking up all those essential nutrients. Um, trying to con co correct a magnesium deficiency, you need to be patient because it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like using iron or nitrogen on a plant where you'll see an immediate results. So just be patient with it. Um, applications, if, if you're injecting of our PalmJet MG, if you have a situation like this, you may want to inject more than once a year, maybe up to three times a year for correcting that. Uh, manganese deficiency, another big, big problem. Um, this is uh, something that causes in palms, it causes a, a, an issue called frizzle top. Uh, uh, many of the species are affected down here. It's basically, uh, again, an issue with high pH soil. So when the soil pH gets too high, that manganese becomes unavailable, and this, this is the issue that we have. Um, also, cold temperatures can reduce root activity, which, which also uh, may have an issue on the uptake of manganese. Uh, generally, when you're looking for it, it's going to be chlorotic streaks, streaks on the newer fronds, okay, where a lot of the deficiencies you'll see in the older fronds, this actually affects the newer fronds. That's why it's kind of an important disease. And this was a study done a while ago um, regarding manganese, since it's such an important um, nutrient. And this was done, you can see this chart here. Uh, this was a palm jet uh, injected. And the brown bar there was a soil application of manganese. Um, and you can see after month one through trunk injection, we have a lot more holding capacity and a lot more manganese in that palm. A uh, little over 100 parts per million, whereas after one month of soil applied, it was about 18 parts per million. Uh, the next set over in month three, you can see we actually had more parts per million in month three than month one. So that's a good thing. That means that manganese was staying in the palm and um, actually move, more of it was moving up into the fronds. In month three, you can see that that soil applied uh, was actually in a deficiency. In month six, we still had a surplus of manganese. So uh, again, what we're doing here is we're, you know, we talked about soil conditions and soil pH. When we do a trunk injection, we're actually bypassing where the issue may be. So we're getting those nutri nutrients directly into the plant. Iron, it's really not much of a problem here that we see in palms. Um, it looks you know, usually symptomatic uh, in, real, in factors that influence active uptake. And this could be the following. It could be poor, poor soil aeration. So your compact soils are not going to allow for iron uptake. Planting too deeply is another um, issue and root injuries. Um, but usually if the, if, they're, if the soil's good and they're planted correctly, we usually don't see too much of a problem in palms with iron. Boron, this is another, uh, I've seen some really, actually that picture on the left there, I took that down in West Palm Beach and I just thought that that was a really good shot of what a severe boron deficiency looks like. Um, boron does let readily leach through the soil and it's very common in dry, dry soils. And again, we have a lot of that down here in Florida. Um, some of the symptoms, and, and it's various, but if you look, um, to the left, you know, we have that curling and twisting of the foliage. And if you look to the right there, that's a queen palm. And that's what we call an accordion type effect where the, the fronds, the actually leaflets look like, you know, they're, they're bent like an accordion. We can also see dwarfing and bending of leaflets as well. Uh, the necrosis, necrosis symptoms are in the tips and very, very similar to lethal yellowing. You know, a lot of times too, uh, some diseases and nutrient deficiencies and even insect problems uh, sometimes it's hard to differentiate 
between them. So this is PalmJet, and again, this helps with what we just showed, all those issues. Um, you know, it's got nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, iron, manganese, magnesium, zinc, and boron. So it's, it's a nice nutrient package there, um, and we, we're seeing some great results with this out in the field. Now I'll talk a little bit about insect pests. So palm skeletonizer, and, and again, I see a lot of this down here in Florida. A lot of, of palms are affected by it. Um, I was told it was, it, it's not really, it's more of a cosmetic thing. It, it does affect the older fronds, but when I look at fronds like this, and I've seen some palms that are, were heavily infested, when they're feeding on active live tissue, I look at that as a little bit more than cosmetic because over time, it can stress that plant out and lead into other issues with the plant just not being healthy. So there are ways we can uh, go after that as well. This is actually a study that we did quite a few years ago uh, here in Orlando at the Gaylord Palms Resort. And we used two different products in this. We used emamectin benzoate, which is triage, and we used azosol. Uh, if you look at those bars on the left, that was the day that the uh, study was installed. And we had a lot of damage on the uh, palms that we were actually treating. Uh, the, the reason there's not as much damage on the um, untreated palms was because they wanted to treat all the palms in front of the building and they, they actually, we used the palms around the pool uh, for our untreated checks. And that day they had just trimmed those palms, so there wasn't much damage. But what's really interesting is if you look 35 days after treatment on the right, you can see that the azosol performed very well, as did the emamectin benzoate. So we had some uh, really nice results out of that, you know, treated versus untreated. And um, that was, uh, like I said, that was quite a while, while ago, uh, but you can see the increase. We had almost, we had about 28, 29 damaged fronds, a new damage in those untreated. And that was, um, we, there was 10 palms in each set in this study. Ambrosia beetle, another, uh, not, not only attacking trees, but we also have ambrosia beetle that uh, really does a job on, on quite a few palms here. Um, this is a, a coconut palm over here, and you can see that trunk is just peppered. And sometimes when you look at this, you may think it's something else, like a bleeding canker or something, but when you get up close to that palm, you'll see very, very tiny holes about the size of a match head, and that's the ambrosia beetle. Um, and again, it generally attacks weaker dying palms. You know, and that's what ambrosia beetles do. Uh, so again, if you've got a healthier palm with all the nutrients in it, it's going to be less likely to be attacked from some of these other pests. Uh, you'll see bleeding and brass found around the trunk, like you'd see in that picture on the left. Um, ambrosia beetles will kill the palm. It killed this palm right here. Um, treatments are best proactively, like with really anything that, you know, whether we're trying to control diseases or insects. Um, you can use a three-step program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in this talk, with triage, because triage does a very, very good job on ambrosia beetles. Red palm mite. Uh, this is an issue that was, it was, um, when I first moved down to Florida, we saw a lot more of this red palm mite, and then for a while, for a few years, we weren't hearing anything about it, and now I'm starting to hear about it again. It, it, it affects several palms including phoenix palms, Christmas palms, coconuts, and bird of paradise. And bird of paradise aren't palms, but this red palm mite seems to go after the bird of paradise as well. If you take a look at that picture up on the left, that's the, the mites feeding. And like um, most mites, they feed on the underside of the leaves. Um, a real simple test is just taking a white piece of paper and shake the frond. And you'll see the, if you see little orange spots like that on the, on the, the paper, you can kind of smash them. If they smash and leave a streak, that means that they're active. Um, so it's a quick, quick and easy way um, to, to see if you've got an infestation. Uh, it leaves yellow spots on the leaves because it's a piercing sucking insect that actually sucks uh, the juices right out of the leaf. And so the leaves will have a chlorotic look, um, especially in severe infestations. And again, mites can also be a situation of stress, of, of drought issues, things like that, that will cause these types of uh, uh, issues. Triage R10 and G4 are both labeled um, for the red palm mites. So we have something that's actually labeled for it and does a really nice job on it. You should get two year control uh, of that mite with one application. But triage is also labeled for many, many other pests 
Um, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Also with the R10, real quick, it's our newest formulation. It's a 9.7% active ingredient. So the doses on this are gonna be much, much less than the G4. And you know, sometimes we have problems with getting product into a palm. So this is a perfect uh, product for palms because the, the doses are gonna be so small. Palmetto weevil, this is another very, very important insect uh, that will kill palms uh, fairly quickly. Um, the larva feeds in the trunk. And if you look at that top picture on the right, that's an untreated palm. Uh, that was over in near Sarasota, Florida. And um, that palm right there, that's a Bismarck palm, was directly across the street from the treated palm. So uh, the customer that didn't want that one treated uh, is, ended up spending a lot more money to have that removed and replaced than the customer across the street that treated his palm and saved it. And I've been out there uh, within the last year and that, that palm is still doing fine. It's on a program now to protect it. So again, what, what does it attack? It attacks stress palms, right? So it's, it's important to make sure that we're getting proper fertilization in these palms so we don't run into these problems. Palmetto weevil is native to Florida and you can see the host there. Uh, some of the hosts are Bismarck's, Canary, Latania, and Sable among others, but this insect has expensive taste because it seems to go after some of the more expensive um, palms. Uh, females can lay over 200 eggs in a lifetime, so that makes it a very serious pet pest when you have that high of a population of larva feeding. And the larva can be about the size of your thumb, so it really, really can do a lot of damage in, in a little amount of time. Eggs are laid at the base of the leaves and hatch in about three days. The larva feeds on soft tissue around the apical meristem, um, and the cocoon is actually formed within the palm fibers, and the adults emerge in a few weeks. So, um, you know, really uh, treating uh, with something like a palm jet and maybe actually um, alternating your treatments with uh, triage so that we don't build up any resistance would probably be the best, uh, best way to go. Rugo spiraling white fly. This was a very important insect back in 2012. Um, it has since really tapered off, but I've been getting some calls uh, that it is starting to flare up again over in the Jensen Beach area. I just got a call and I got some pictures and it was a, the main thing that this, this insect does is it's a piercing sucking insects. It's an insect that produces a honeydew and the honeydew results in heavy sooty mold. So it's a few things. It's, it's a mess. It, it's very sticky, the honeydew. And as that honeydew ferments, it causes um, um, a black mold to form that's known as sooty mold. Um, so it, it, it's really a nuisance insect, but it, it can also damage the palm when they're severely infested. This right here was a study that we did with Imaget. You can see the uh, Imaget treated versus the untreated. And what we did was we measured the percent of sooty mold in this, um, in this study because that, that's the telltale sign that the insect is active. So if you look at that there, you know, we had um, a few spots with the image yet where it was a little over 10% sooty mold, which is, which is very acceptable versus the untreated where we had issues of, uh, you know, 65% sooty mold. That's, pretty, that's a pretty heavy infestation if you're seeing that much sooty mold and honeydew. This is just some of the uh, pictures uh, of heavily infestation. Uh, it looks almost like snow on the plants. Um, and you can see uh, what it does to vehicles that are parked under it. Um, it just leaves uh, like somebody poured molasses on the car and it will eventually turn into that black sooty mold. Scale insects, um, many different scale insects that we see on palms. Um, sometimes it's, it's just, you know, it can be just more um, superficial, aesthetic, but um, if they're heavily feeding, it can cause damage. Uh, same uh, for your soft scales, it's gonna be the same, um, same treatment as for the white fly, you would go with Imaget. They are piercing sucking insects. Again, you look for the insects on the underside of the leaf. You will find that same type of honeydew presence. You know, one thing, one thing when you're out there in the field, if you see honeydew and it's sticky, you probably have some sort of piercing sucking insects, whether it's a, a woolly adelgid, whether it's aphid, whether it's white fly or, or scales, they all produce this honeydew and the sooty mold. Um, so 
If you do have an issue with armored scale, I, I suggest using AceJet for a, a quick knockdown and follow it up uh, with Imajet for long-term control. Royal palm bug, this is another uh, important pest here in Florida. Um, it's one of the very few uh, anthropods or insects that feed on Cuban royal palms. You know, most Cuban royal palms don't have that much, uh, many issues, but this is one. And it seems to be more situated down in South Florida. Um, the adults are extremely small. And one of the issues is that by looking at it from the ground, because these Cuban laurels can be 30, 40, 50 feet high, uh, from the ground, it can look more like a nutrient deficiency uh, issue. Um, the bugs, bugs feed on and cause yellow spots on the newer foliage, like many insects, they'll feed on more of that tender foliage. And you'll see some streaks that are brownish um, and wilting will occur as the uh, pressure increases. Not a bad idea to get um, binoculars or if you have a drone, it'd be a great way to, to, to see you know, if you do have activity. Damage is mainly aesthetic, but long-term feeding, as with any insect, uh, can affect that overall plant health and vigor. Um, this, we don't see the smaller ones attack that often. It's usually the taller ones and um, you know, the ones that have the higher uh, tall canopies. Imajet, again, does a great job on, on royal palm bug. Uh, you should get a full season control out of one application. So now we'll talk about a little bit about some diseases. And, and again, these are the most common diseases that we're seeing here. Some of you throughout the country may be seeing different uh, uh, issues, but uh, here we see a lot of bud rot and most of the palms are susceptible to this, uh, this issue. Uh, phytophthora is the most common issue and I believe they've identified two different types of phytophthora uh, that causes the bud rot. Um, you know, like with anything, sometimes it's hard to um, identify these, uh, these types of issues, but when you start to see browning going on uh, in, the newer, in, the, in the newer growth coming out of the bud, um, you may want to look for bud rot. But to identify it officially, it's going to need to be sent off to a lab. Um, but a, an application of phosphajet, I would do that right away because that's not going to hurt anything. And if it is bud rot, it's, it's definitely going to help it. Uh, you'll see discoloring and wilting of the spear leaf. And whenever we see that, that throws up a red flag because that means that that, that, that palm is not healthy. Those leaves will turn chlorotic and to necrotic, so they'll die off. And then the spear leaf is basically going to collapse. And once that happens, because palms are monocots, uh, the palm's done. It's, it's dead. Thebolopsis uh, trunk rot is another important disease. And I took this picture, was up in the panhandle after, um, it was a year after they had a very, very bad uh, cold spell with freezing temperatures and that can trigger this disease. And generally what you'll see is that the, the palm about two thirds of the way up the trunk will just collapse over. Um, sometimes it'll just fall off the trunk. Um, you, can, you can get it from uh, common way as trunk wounds that, are, that become infected. And the rot is definitely more prevalent in the non-lignified or lightly lignified plant tissue, which means the softer plant tissue, not the hardened off plant tissue. And generally, like, we, like I said, we, we usually see this in the upper third of the trunk. That's a telltale symptom right there of the trunk just breaking off. Fusarium wilt, this is another disease that we see a lot of down here in Florida. We see it in our uh, queen palms and we see it in our Washingtonia palms. It's caused by a fungus, a Fusarium oxysporum. Symptoms again would be necrosis, but it's gonna be done, when you, if you cut it off the pedal, you're gonna notice half of it to be brown. And, and that's also what happens, uh, the telltale sign is that half the frown, frond will die off or turn brown before the other half does. Um, one thing though to know, notice is the symptoms are also very, uh, very close to pedial blight. Now, the problem with fusarium wilt is right now there is no, um, there's no cure for it. Um, so again, my theory is if, if that palm is healthy, it's gonna be less, uh, less likely to come down with this disease. And older fronds are affected first. And again, here in, in, uh, in Florida, we're looking at queen palms and Washingtonia palms that get this type of fusarium wilt. Phosphagit. Um, is great for uh, helping uh, 
basically increase the health and vigor of a, of a palm and getting your palms on the three-step program with phosphagen again is going to make them uh, that much healthier and maybe that much less likely to, to get some of these diseases. Now this is the big one that's killing a lot of palms here in Florida, thousands of palms. It's lethal bronzing. It was formerly called Texas Phoenix Palm Decline or TPPD. So if you see lethal bronzing, it's not a new disease. It's just they, they renamed the disease because they're finding it's affecting more than just Phoenix species of palms. And it really, uh, the name kind of goes with the symptoms. The, the, the older fronds will definitely get a bronzish uh, hue to them. And that's one of the telltale signs. Um, it's tra transmitted by a phloem feeding insect. Uh, they, I think they are close to identifying, or they may have identified it, but they're looking at plant hoppers, leaf, leaf hoppers, and psyllids that are, are piercing sucking insects. It's a type of bacterial called phytoplasm. And again, we're seeing more and more species that are affected, not just the, the Phoenix species. First things you start to see is the inflorescence or the flowers are affected first. They'll begin to darken. And then the older fronds will actually turn a, a reddish brown that really, uh, it's almost a bronze. Unlike the lethal yellows, that was a very bright yellow, this is definitely a bronzish look to it. You can see that in the picture over on the left. Um, the last thing that happens is the death of the bud. And once the bud dies, uh, the palm dies as well. So um, again, with palms being monocots. We do have a white paper available. So if you want to contact me on that, I can send it out. And, and what we got out of that white paper was we did have enhanced management results when using the three-step program incorporated with the oxytetracycline, the oxytetracycline, uh, the Arbor OTC, that's a, that's a um, antibiotic and that will help to suppress the disease. Uh, but we feel that the Imaget was helping to control the vector the phosphajet is just helping to improve that, improve that overall health, and the palm jet is giving all the nutrients needed uh, for that palm. So it's a, it's a good program. The OTC needs to be applied at three to four times per season to protect that palm. And that's our Arbor OTC. Um, so again, our, the uh, Arbor OTC can be used on many you know, trees for all types of bacterial type diseases. Uh, including lethal yellows and also uh, lethal bronzing. One year suppression on plants except for palms. Uh, palms you're going to need to do at least three to four applications uh, per season. Some other issues that we see here in Florida, of course we get a lot of storms and, and they can do a lot of damage to a palm and sometimes we don't really see the damage for a year or two but when a hurricane hits those buds really can get um, tossed around and uh, sometimes we'll see palms dying not too long after a storm from that damage. They're pretty resilient and pretty resistant, but um, you know, some of these storms can really kind of beat up those bugs. Lightning, um, I live here in central Florida and we're, we're the lightning capital of the world, I think. So we do see a lot of lightning strikes on palms, uh, pretty easy to identify. You know, you gotta look at those palms they are basically water columns, right? So they, they're gonna attract lightning. And then in areas too, we do have cold damage. There's um, uh, some palms that are just not planted in the right place. You know, we have about seven agronomic zones going through Florida. So palms that we're planting down in, in Miami, uh, a lot of those palms we can't plant in central Florida because it's the, the, the environment is just that much different. So if you're out there selecting palms, I would recommend selecting palms that are adapted to your area so you don't have as many problems. Um, I do know up in the panhandle, or they, they plant a lot of palms from the south and then they'll get a, they'll get a freeze every now and then and they'll, they'll lose a lot of palms just because it's, it's you know, a plant that's just not adap adapted to that um, zone. Other issues, you know, these are some of the things that um, I've seen in the past. I don't believe we're using climbing spikes that much, but uh, climbing spikes are not good for the health of the tree. And you can see that in these pictures right here. So avoid using the climbing spikes. So now we'll talk a little bit about injection. These are actually some uh, pictures of palms that uh, I, I did these two palms. I did the one on the left uh, with that three-step program. And this is 16 months after the application. And you can see the difference 
uh, in, in the canopy of that treated versus the untreated, how much better and healthier that new growth is. Um, this was actually right after that freeze, and this is around the time they were starting to lose a lot of, of, a lot of their medules uh, to, um, to the trunk rot. So um, again, that was 16 months after the application, and nothing else was done to that. So some of the injection advantages, uh, for one, we're delivering that treatment inside the tree. We're sealing that, that treatment in the tree too, so that tree is receiving the full dose. We have reduced exposure to the environment, reduced exposure to the applicator, um, so it's a nice clean application. We're also getting that full dose in the tree, and that's important. You know, when we're out there applying products, we wanna make sure that we're giving that plant what it needs to take care of the problem that we have. Uh, we also have the longest residuals with these injections, and we've got a lot of data to support that. I also say it helps us keep within legal per acre pesticide limits, whether you know, you're treating palms or any type of trees. Uh, some of these plants can be very, very large, and there are products out there that are being drenched that have limitations to the amount of product you can put down. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Imidacloprid, there's a limit of four tenths of a pound per urban acre. So if you're out treating large palms or trees, uh, you, need to, you need to take a look at that and make sure that you're not going over that at rate, if you are, uh, that's, that's breaking the law because that label is the law. Uh, we also have a wide open treatment for, for uh, applications. You know, down here, we've got a lot of wind, which is really, really gonna affect how much we can spray. We've got a lot of rain during the rainy season and we have very sandy soil, so we don't have a good holding capacity for, for soil applications. I wanna share this a little slide with you. I know it's kind of an eye chart, but I want you to look at the, the right column. Uh, these were all different uh, imidacloprid products that were applied. Uh, this was a study that was done in Hawaii on erythrina gall wasp. And this was taken 10 weeks after the treatment. So you can see on the, on the right side there, that's the amount of product that, that was concentrated in the leaves um, of the, these erythrina. So you can see, you know, um, you've got Imicide, Imicide, which is Moget, that had 2.9. Arbor, Arbor Systems Pointer had 7.3. And if you look at Imaget, it had 320.7. I mean, that's not even close. The closest one was actually a product that was gonna be out called Merit 200 SL. It was a 17.1% active ingredient. It had 38.7. But what's interesting is if you look at that first, or I should say the second column of the rate of active ingredient per inch diameter, that merit was applied at almost twice the amount of active ingredient per diameter inch, and the image at actually had almost 10 times more at half the rate than that merit product. And if you look at down here at the bottom, the soil application was applied in almost three times the amount of active ingredient per diameter inch, and it had 0.2. So, you know, I look at that there too, and something you need to be aware of, if you're only getting that much active ingredient out to the pest feeding site, I would be worried about developing pest resistance because you're probably not getting enough product out there to uh, control the insect that you're going after. So um, <clears throat> I want to look here too about being environmentally responsible. I think, you know, that these products, the way they work, it's, it's really amazing. At just such small amounts of product, uh, the results that we do get. Uh, if you look at a medium-sized palm, it takes 20 milliliters of uh, Imaget, and that's uh, 0.68 fluid ounces. And that's season-long control for piercing, sucking insects, okay? It's a 5% formulation. So if we break that down, and when we say a medium-sized palm, we could be looking at a palm with a, a 15 to 20-foot trunk and maybe a 20-foot uh, canopy spread. So that's a medium-sized palm here in Florida is a, a big palm. So if you look at the actual amount of active ingredient to treat that palm for a year, it's really just one milliliter of active ingredient that's, that's controlling those insects. Um, by comparison, a teaspoon is five milliliters. So it's, it would be one fifth of a teaspoon to control that insect for the season. How about the arbor plug? The arbor plug is what we anchor into the tree or the palm's vascular tissue, and it acts as a one-way valve. Uh, it's got an uh, internal rubber septum. So what happens is the, the needle goes through that, we inject the product into the vascular tissue, the needle's pulled out and everything is sealed into that tree or that palm. 
It's just a cross section of the air plug, but that's a, a key, key component to trunk injection. And here we have the injection process. Um, so what we want to do is we want to drill into that trunk, and generally we go about a third of the way into the trunk. Um, the drill bits that we give you are four inches, so if it's a large palm, you can just sink that drill bit all the way in. Um, you want to make sure, like with anything, whether you're doing trees or palms, as you're moving from plant to plant, be sure to disinfect your drill bit. Isopropyl alcohol will work well. I also use a wire brush to get any of the shavings out of the drill bit. Then we set the plug and we inject. The plug is set, when we first set it, it's just set slightly deeper than flush. Um, if you see that the plug starts to leak when you're injecting it, just tap it in a little further until the leakage stops. And the best piece of equipment to use to inject would be the, the quick jet air because we can adjust the um, pressure on it. I, I generally adjust the pressure to about 40 or 50 PSI on that. Um, and that seems to be enough to get the product in, but not too much because palms can have very, very uh, delicate uh, vascular tissue, unlike a hardwood tree. So we want to make sure that we're not damaging it. And it seems the sweet spot's right around 40 to 50 uh, PSI. How many plugs do we use? Again, with a palm being a monocot, we just need to tap into really, it's, it's, it's basically in that side, that trunk is just vascular bundles of xylem and phloem. So we just need to tap into those vascular bundles. So in most cases, we just need one plug. If you're having a hard time getting all the product into the palm, you can always put another plug in. But because um, palms are monocots, they don't compartmentalize like trees. So that plug will always be there. So we try to minimize uh, how much we drill into the palm. The good news is though that many times you can go back and, and reuse that plug that you put in there. When you go to do another application, try to reuse that plug. If it will, will accept the product, then go right ahead. If not, then you're gonna have to set another plug into that palm. It's just a cross section of trees and palms, and again, trees have you know they're they're, they're dicots. They have many buds. They put out um, you know their, their growth rings, the trunks. Basically, the they they, they um, grow outwards. So you've got those growth rings. Palms grow upwards. You know, the palm is actually more uh, related to a grass plant than a tree. We call them palm trees, but they're they're really more like grass. So you can see. In that cross section on the right there, we're trying to tap into that nice white, um, those vascular bundles there. So again, you may have to drill fairly deep and when you're drilling into that palm, you'll feel when you get into that softer, uh, good uptake tissue, it'll be, you'll, it'll be a lot softer. I guess that's the best way I could describe it. Um, let's see. Now some of the products. HJET2, we talked about that a little bit back. If you've got hard scales, it's great, but HJET's another great product too. If you do have an immediate need, uh, you have an outbreak of leaf feeding caterpillars, you wanna clean something up really quick, use HJET. It's very, very broad spectrum, uh, very, very quick knockdown, um, high level of efficacy, efficacy but um, it does have a short resi residual. So if you're going after a certain insect, I recommend following it up with uh, either triage or imaget, depending on the insect for your long-term control. Harbor OTC, we talked about that again for use on, on um, uh, lethal bronzing and any other bacterial type issues you may have. But again, down here in Florida, we're using it mostly for the uh, lethal bronzing. Azosol, another great product if you've got fruit trees. Um, there are concerns too with, um, you know, palms are uh, pollinators. So uh, many times a year we do have a lot of bees around um, uh, those palm trees. And if you want something effective that's not going to affect, um, um, you know, pollinators, as a is a great one to use, but again, also great for uh, fruit trees. Um, and it's also OMRI certified too. So uh, we have zero day reentry, zero days to harvest, and it, the uh, product actually comes from the neem plant. It can be injected, but it can also be sprayed and also put through chemigation. The three-step program, now I'm gonna just go over this briefly because we're getting close to the end here. Uh, what it is, is an insect control with either Imaget or triage, depending on what type of insects you're trying to control, disease and stress control with Phosphajet, and a nutritional uh, application with PalmJet MG. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, increase the health and vigor 
of the plant, get the needed nutrition in the plant. So we've got a, a healthy palm. And then we're gonna use uh, insect control jet. Usually it's ImageJet that we're using. We wanna get the product in there that's gonna help it protect it from insects that might otherwise kill that palm. Also wanna talk a little bit about proper planting because I know here in Florida and pretty much anywhere I go, I think a big problem we have in the landscape whether it's trees or palms or any plant material, is just improper planting. So with palms, you don't have to have that hole as wide as you would with a tree, but you want to dig your hole at least six inches wider on, on all sides, and six inches deeper than the plant's existing root ball. And we put sand in, six inches of sand in the bottom of the hole, and you want to use the me a measuring tape to determine the height width of the root ball and dig accordingly. You do not want to plant too deeply. So um, that, that's a huge factor. Um, I recommend watering it in with Nutri-Root and, and many times most palms we do have to stake just to hold them up for about a year you keep the stakes on. I want to talk a little bit, a bit about Nutri-Root and how it helps, it promotes growth, it reduces watering, it's got a product in there called Hydratane that coats the roots and will actually pull moisture in from the pore space and it also has seaweed extracts that are gonna help promote root growth. So we're doing three things here. We're fertilizing those roots, we're getting those roots to grow, and then we're also coating those, those um, roots with hydrotain to help pull that moisture in. Um, I recommend doing at least four applications of this throughout, throughout the season. And again, you can apply it right to the root ball when you're planting, or once it is planted, you can just do an over the top, or if you want to do a subsurface application, you can do it that way too. Pruning, a little bit about pruning, because this is another mistake that we uh, see a lot of here in Florida. They, these palms here, palms on the left, those are Washingtonia. That's what you want them to look, at, look like. We want those fronds to be at about three and nine if we were looking at a clock. Not like over here, this looks like a, um, you know, 10 and two or a, maybe even 11 and one, but you're, you're removing way, way more green material that has chlorophyll in it and that helps with photosynthesis and helps keep those palms healthy. So over pruning can stress palms out and cause some of these other problems that we just discussed. And that's it for this presentation. Um, can, we, can we do questions, Zach? Yeah, hi, absolutely. Uh, we have time. I didn't see anyone put any questions in. Uh, so I'm going to stop the recording.